It's a documentary film. It will follow all of us in our daily lives. They will all have to get used to cameras being here all the time. All of you on best behavior. Ever wanted to take a deep dive inside the real events covered in The Crown? Join me, Laura Jackson, as we explore the now banned royal family documentary in this edition of Beneath the Crown. Who wants magic when you can have transparency? Access into the lives and minds of the royals is commonplace now, but until the landmark royal family documentary in 1969, the media had been firmly shut out. Was it the right decision to let them in? It's a question still being asked 50 years on. The BBC ITV co-production entitled Royal Family was filmed over the course of a year, following the Queen and her family on their daily routines. It's jolly powerful that light, isn't it? The documentary stemmed from the negative shift in attitudes towards the monarchy in the 1960s. Equality had come to the forefront of public consciousness, a value not easily compatible with hereditary privilege. Deference was no longer an entitlement. Admiration had to be earned. We are the endangered species. And so Buckingham Palace's dynamic new press secretary, William Heseltine, developed a cunning plan. Television was seen as the best way to connect with the masses and alter their perceptions. If the royals were shown as individuals defending the interests of the people, surely that would help their cause. They must all seem very glamorous. British Olympic team for lunch, the American president for dinner, but it's, you know, it's a lot of work, a lot of preparation and a lot of expense. In terms of what it actually achieves, I like to think that it, we, are worth every penny. Filming wasn't initially a smooth process. On one occasion, the Queen's personal protection officer karate chopped a long boom microphone that was thrust out in front of her. But everyone quickly grew used to the camera crew being around. Prince Philip chaired a joint BBC ITV committee to agree what was going to be filmed. He wanted to portray the royals as a hard-working family. Scenes that showed them participating in the aristocratic pastimes of grouse and pheasant shooting were cut in favour of everyday scenes. The Queen feeding her horses, buying Prince Edward's suite at the village shop, Prince Charles practising on his cello, and the Duke of Edinburgh painting. The family preparing a barbecue at Balmoral or getting ready for Christmas at Windsor and Sandringham. Reality TV in the 60s was ever so slightly less dramatic than what we have now. We are being filmed watching television. That people might watch us watching television and their own television sets at home. This really is plumbing new depths of banality. The show's purpose was to present the royals as more relatable and accessible. The Royal Family documentary was screened first in black and white on BBC One on June the 21st, 1969, and then in colour on ITV the following week. A staggering three quarters of the British public watched it. Wonderful viewing figures. The highest for a factual documentary ever. The documentary was sold to more than 125 countries, with the Queen donating her share of the profits to the Society of Film and Television Arts, now known as BAFTA. It helped the organisation move to new headquarters in Piccadilly, London. <laughs> Despite the Queen receiving praise from viewers for coming across as natural and humorous, the royal family has not allowed it to be shown since the late 1970s. The Queen was said to have regretted her private life being put on display. Crucially, the relationship between the media and the royals would never be the same again. The floodgates had been opened, and their private lives were increasingly ripe for public consumption. The smoke and the mirrors, the mystery and the protocol, it's not there to keep us apart, it is there to keep us alive. 